Our speaker today is uh, James Mertens, who is a uh, recent addition to our faculty. Um, Jim, you know, I don't think we've checked that you can share screen unless you did it while I wasn't looking. Uh, I assume it's working here. Okay, while he's working on that, I'll just, uh, I'll just, I'll just continue. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, Jim is a uh, recent um, addition to the physics department and also a member of the McDonald Center for Space Sciences. Uh, he received his PhD from Case Western Reserve University, which is a, uh, a real uh, stronghold of the kind of work he does. He got his bachelor's degree at The Ohio State University. And prior to coming to uh, Washington University as a faculty member, uh, he was a postdoctoral researcher at York, an associate postdoctoral researcher at the Perimeter Institute, which is a high powered uh, research institute uh, in Canada and a CITA national fellow. So Jim works on theoretical cosmology, uh, general relativity and numerical simulations. This is of course a really important area of modern physics and we're very glad to have him. His research focuses on uh, relativistic cosmology uh, working to improve our understanding of how gravity and matter uh, interact across the largest distances as our um, universe evolves. And his title today is Interpreting Observations and Testing Cosmological Models. Um, and I understand that he'd be pleased to take questions uh, during the talk, but uh, you know, uh, you know, I ask that you stay uh, muted uh, unless you're asking a question. And if you want to, you can type your question into the chat box on Zoom, which I'll be monitoring. And, uh, you know, I can uh, ask Jim to answer your question, uh, you know, when there's a, a good uh, stopping point in his talk. So with that said, uh, Jim? Right. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, Ohio, the Ohio State Capital T. So, um, it, so yeah, as as Mike mentioned, uh, as I go through this, feel free to post questions in the chat or to um, unmute yourself and interrupt. And and just to reiterate, as Mike said, if you're not um, asking a question, please uh, try and keep yourself muted. But uh, do feel do feel free to unmute. Um, yeah, so, so as the title says, I'll be discussing a number of the observations we make uh, in order to understand cosmological systems in particular, and especially the different types of modeling we might do in order to try and interpret these um, uh, different observations. And so I'll be introducing a number of ideas through this talk. Uh, as we get closer towards the end, I've actually asked a couple of students to present the work that they're doing. So I'll have a couple brief five, 10 minute um, presentations by them. And they've been working on some really uh, interesting cutting edge, uh, uh, different modeling techniques. And I'll let them tell you all about that. So just, you yeah, know, before I get further, everyone can see slides. Right, so in cosmology, there are a number of things, a number of big questions that we are hoping to answer. Um, so you may have heard of the phenomena of dark matter and dark energy. Um, and I'm gonna hit these two items as well as uh, phenomena that show up in the early universe. Um, so different models trying to explain uh, the different processes that went on and how the universe itself started. Um, and I'm going to go through this and I'm going to try to hit this at a, a few different levels of complexity, if you like. Uh, so first, I'm just going to say what historically different ideas have been out there. Um, and by historically, I do mean uh, 
you know, traveling back in time to around the BC era. Um, so, so sort of as a, a zero introduction to this. Um, then as a first iteration on how we might approach cosmology and how we, um, how we go about inferring the presence of dark matter and dark energy. Um, uh, I'll go through the most basic models we can write down uh, in order to um, try and understand uh, and infer that these um, uh, phenomena actually exist. Uh, then I'll go through another round and say, um, well, okay, th those were the, you know, kind of the most basic model we could write down. What's a slightly more complicated way to describe um, our universe? And does this give us any new information? Uh, and then hit it one more time <clears throat> and kind of go through, um, well, okay, let's not, let, let's try to make as few assumptions about what our universe might look like as possible. Um, and in particular, when I get to this point, I'll be discussing some of the recent work uh, simulating or modeling our universe. And then I'll um, um, introduce the students at that point and have them discuss some of the some of what they've been working on. Um, so this will get um, sort of increasingly technical as, as things go along, um, starting off with history, working our way at the simulations of the universe. Um, and I have no illusions that I'll do a perfect job explaining everything, so again, uh, feel feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions as we go along. All right, so <clears throat> uh, starting off, historically, um, we can ask what what have people considered the universe to be made of, um, and how has it been arranged? Uh, so, around 100 AD, we have this picture of a Ptolemaic universe. Uh, so. The Earth is at the center of everything. Uh, we're at the middle of the universe. Our location is fixed in space, and then everything else kind of orbits around us. So, the Moon is closest. Mercury is next closest to us. Um, uh, then Venus, then the Sun, uh, then a uh, few further planets. And then you might also imagine, okay, um, maybe there's some medium that we're sitting in. Like maybe there's this vast ocean. Uh, maybe it's made of stars, maybe it's made of some elements, water, fire, something else, uh, something else that our universe is, some sort of bath that our universe is sitting in. Uh, but this was the extent of the universe. And at this point, um, you know, people had thought about the idea that, oh, uh, um, you know, there's all this ordinary matter we see around us, but nobody had thought much about the idea that there might be invisible forms of matter, um, for example, this dark energy and dark matter that we'll be discussing later. Um, so, so skipping ahead, people realize eventually, you know, of course this picture is not quite right. The earth is not quite at the center of the universe. Uh, you know, um, Copernicus comes up with this heliocentric model um, along with some Islamic and Indian astronomers and, you know, the 1100s, 1500s. Um, but still the idea that there's this invisible matter is uh, not really put forward quite yet. And so in fact, um, um, even you know, when people think about phenomena in our solar system like comets, uh, those were considered to be um, atmospheric phenomena. People really don't think about the idea that there could be new types of matter. What we see is not really all there is, at least uh, in, in a, from a physics standpoint. Um, okay, but people do notice uh, eventually that these other forms of matter notwithstanding, uh, the Earth is not quite the center of the universe, so this picture isn't quite right. Um, the Sun's actually at the center of a solar system. The Sun is just a star. Uh, there might be other stars. There might be other collections of stars, which we come to call galaxies. Um, and so our universe is considerably larger than we thought. Um, but it's not really until, say, the early 1900s, um, um, researcher Lord Kelvin notices or is, is looking at the dynamics of motions of stars in the Milky Way and notices their um, velocity dispersion is larger than um, one might expect just considering the ordinary matter that's there, its gravitational interaction. So, so things are flying around. 
um, faster than you might expect, given that you want them to be held together by their own gravity. So this is the first uh, notion that I know of where there's um, where people have considered the idea that uh, there need to be there needs to be some form of invisible matter. Um, Coven proposes, oh, maybe this is just all a bunch of you know dark stars or stars that you know maybe they're too small for us to see. Um, and uh, in, in this line of work, he um, Coven had sort of predicted the ratio of this you know, dark material uh, that was needed um, to the amount of visible matter stars. Um, I think, you know, it was off by orders of magnitude and the amount of, or at least an order of magnitude or so on the amount of uh, dark matter that might be needed in order to explain the motions of the stars in our galaxy. Um, so, so later on, um, um, we have uh, um, uh, Fritz Zwicky in, say, the 1930s uh, looks at this group of galaxies called the Coma, Coma Cluster. Um, the Coma Cluster we now know to, you know, to contain large amounts of dark matter. And Zwicky's analysis is actually in relatively good agreement with um, modern analyses. Uh, but he makes this, you know, a similar argument using the motions of galaxies themselves, um, trying to infer how much um, dark matter is needed to keep the galaxies gravitationally, um, you know, from, from flying off and keep them gravitationally bound. Um, so, so there's this picture that, okay, there is some form of dark matter. Maybe it's just, you know, something like failed stars. Um, there is some visible matter. And it's not really until much later, 1970s, much more recently, uh, that we notice, oh, okay, there, you know, actually needs to be some substantial amount of dark matter. And so this was um, um, noticed by Vera Rubin and Kent Ford. Um, so they were observing, I think, Andromeda Galaxy in particular, um, and were able to more carefully quantify the amount of dark matter by looking at uh, the rotation of Andromeda Galaxy, the velocities of stars in the galaxy. Um, and we're able to pin down exactly what the, uh, at least to, to a good approximation what the amount of dark matter in Andromeda relative to the amount of visible matter in stars and um, gas must be. Okay. But it's not really until 1990s and later that we get very precise measurements of how much matter there is in the universe. Um, so this these measurements come about when we um, start to measure distances to objects. And this is an idea I'll head on um, in a, a little bit later in the next iteration of this talk. But, um, but, but Einstein's equations do tell us how much, you know, how exactly how matter sources uh, something where we refer to as cosmological expansion. And by measuring distances to objects, we can infer how much the universe has expanded and in turn, what types of matter must have caused that expansion. And so our picture today looks something much more like this, um, where in fact, the amount of visible matter we see is just a tiny fraction. Then we have some form of dark matter, <clears throat> um, something that looks like it could be, you know, failed stars, but uh, uh, that particular idea has been ruled out. Um, and then this other um, more mysterious form of energy, if you like, <clears throat> um, um, dark energy, which is in fact causing our universe to expand and the expansion to accelerate. All right, so just <clears throat> in a little more detail, um, what our universe looks like today. And these are sort of state of the art. I've done a little bit of rounding and making these pie charts, but uh, state of the art composition of our universe. So again, we have um, um, sort of this, you know, 70-ish or so percent of the universe is made up of this mysterious dark energy causing this accelerated expansion. 25% uh, or so, <clears throat> uh, this dark matter, 5% uh, ordinary matter, and that we can break down into, <clears throat> um, you know, four, maybe plus a, a bit percent 
is just in hydrogen and helium gases um, floating around in galaxies and in between galaxies. Um, and then only half a percent or so is actually in stars uh, that we observe. And then there's some uh, appreciable also around half a percent uh, in neutrinos in the universe. And then there's this you know, tiny fraction of a percent that is most of our daily experiences, which is heavier elements, uh, where by heavy, I mean pretty much anything that's not hydrogen and helium. Um, so, so things that um, make up most of what we experience day to day. Uh, and Kenneth, do you have a, a question real quick? So, so what if we added visible energy? Uh, never mind. I, I realize the visible energy is in direct proportion to uh, um, uh, visible matter. So. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. So, so if by visible energy, uh, we, yeah, we could also mean things like photons. Um, and there is... Um, uh, so, so, so I think so, so photons make up a, a very tiny fraction of the energy budget, but if we like, we can lump them in here with neutrinos um, or, or some, some form of radiative matter. But uh, at, at the moment, uh, photons, I think, are, you know, more like a, a part in 10 to the three. So one sort of one one thousandth or less of the energy density of the universe. So I, I didn't even give that one a, a slice, really. Okay, um, so, so that's sort of a historical overview of when we began to infer these different types of matter existed. Um, so now I'm gonna go through in a little more detail, uh, throw up an equation or two, hopefully not too scary, um, uh, how, the, how the different types of matter show up, um, what assumptions go into uh, sort of our, our most basic models of how, um, how we can infer different types of matter given we measure different um, 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 different expansion rates. Okay, so what what do we need to assume in order to um, in order to infer the existence of dark matter and dark energy in the first place? Uh, so first of all, uh, it turns out we need Einstein's equations. So we need general relativity. Um, so most of what I say. And the rest of this talk is going to assume general relativity is correct, although uh, it very well may not be. You know, it's entirely possible that dark matter or dark energy are not some new form of matter, but in fact, our understanding of uh, Einstein's equation, our understanding of gravity uh, using Einstein's equations is wrong, um, which is an, an important idea to consider, but I'm not going to discuss it too much. Um, Another assumption that goes into this, we need to, to some degree, evenly distribute stuff around. Um, so our dark matter, dark energy, stars, ordinary matter, gases. Um, of course, you know, this is obviously not true, like in, here on earth, um, things are clearly not uh, evenly distributed. You know, we can change the local amount of matter um, just by traveling a hundred miles up into space. Um, so, so, um, but if we look at the, um, like if, if we take a, some sort of paintbrush and smear out what the universe looks like, um, and consider, you know, only how the amount of matter in a very large region, um, like billions of light years across, if you like, compares to the amount of matter in another region, also billions of light years across, uh, that there won't be a big difference in the amount of matter between these two regions. Um, and so this is what I mean by evenly distributing stuff around. Okay, and so uh, here I've abbreviated um, um, what I mean by this as H and I, and this stands for, um, I'm going to assume homogeneity and isotropy. Um, and so the, um, um, this is just another way of saying I, I want things to be evenly distributed throughout the universe. Um, and then these other ingredients, uh, I need some form of matter in the universe. I need um, <clears throat> to specify exactly what that is. And it turns out to be, um, to, to work well in our cosmological models if we assume that there is <clears throat> some form of dark matter. 
And I can quantify the fractional amount of dark matter using this omega dark matter parameter. Um, <clears throat> there's this omega B parameter, which that's the amount of baryonic matter, but refers roughly to the amount of matter that uh, we can actually see and detect. So this will be the stars and gas. And then there will also be um, uh, this omega lambda. Um, and this is going to be a stand-in for the fraction of energy that's uh, uh, dark, or sorry, the fraction of uh, matter that's dark energy. And so Alice <clears throat> uh, says, please explain I, uh, I think isotropy. Um, so we have these two ingredients, homogeneity and isotropy. Um, and what I mean by homogeneity is that, you know, if I take two patches, they're going to look the same. So it doesn't matter which patch I'm in. It doesn't matter where I put these patches um, in the universe, they'll look the same. And then by isotropy, um, this is more of a directional statement. So if I'm in one patch and I look at another patch, it doesn't depend on which direction uh, this other patch is. <clears throat> uh, things will, you know, a patch in this direction will look very much the same as a patch in another direction. Uh, so homogeneity, homogeneity is in the statement, it doesn't matter which patch I'm in. And isotropy is, it doesn't matter which other patches I'm looking at where they are. So that's what I mean by isotropy. So that helps. Okay, um, <clears throat> so just to go into a little bit more detail about what I mean by, um, or what I mean when I say we're gonna use Einstein's equations. So you might've seen uh, this famous equation written down at some point. So there are a few terms that appear in this equation. Uh, you know, a couple of these algebraic eight pi gn here is this thing called Newton's constant. Um, uh, the, the important quantities here are this uh, big G with these two little indices mu nu and this big T with these two little indices, mu nu. Um, and this big G uh, with the two indices, mu nu, uh, this is a measure of the amount of um, curvature. So this tells us that, you know, if we have, you know, Einstein's theory tells us that we have, um, um, we live in some space time and the space time itself can be curved and G mu nu here measures the amount of curvature of our space time. And then over here on this side, this uh, uh, T mu nu measures the amount of matter in the universe. And so for, I'm gonna mute. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, so, so Einstein's equations, uh, so, so there are these two little scripts down here. Um, and these scripts uh, are a stand-in for uh, space-time dimension. So either mu or nu here can be either a time dimension or say like an X, Y, or Z, you know, up, down, right, left, forward, backward, uh, some sort of other spatial dimension. Um, <clears throat> and so what happens is if I consider how the universe is curved in time, which is a little, um, bit of a weird concept to think about and how matter is uh, itself changing in time, which again is a, a little kind of a strange concept. Um, but what happens when I do this, I wind up with notions of conservation of energy. Um, and so if I um, uh, were to take um, uh, this mu and this nu and over here are the same, take these to be equal to you know, consider what Einstein's equations look like um, in, in sort of a time direction, um, I get conservation of energy. And in GR, conservation of energy, the equation takes this form. Um, so this uh, expression I've written up here is just another way to write um, this g mu nu equals a pi t mu nu. Um, I just you know, I expanded it out a bit. And so this, this is an equation that is a conservation of energy equation, really. And so this tells me if I have some, um, some curvature in the universe, um, I can have something that looks like an overall expansion of a space time. Um, I can have other types of energy that look like uh, what I'm gonna call gravitational radiation. 
Um, and if, you've, if you're familiar with gravitational waves, this is essentially energy associated with those gravitational waves. And over here on the other side, <clears throat> we have uh, different types of stuff that show up in the universe. So our different forms of matter, light if we like, uh, dark matter and dark energy are gonna show up on this side. And so I can consider different ways to balance this equation. Um, I, need, I need to make sure this equation holds, but in principle, I can um, invent a universe where one of these terms sort of balances with another term. So if I really wanted to, I could say, you know, let's suppose we have a universe where nothing, where we have no curvature. Suppose we have a universe with no matter. Um, so I just have something that looks, you know, I just have some sort of expansion and maybe gravitational radiation. And so that this is this is a perfectly fine idea in general relativity. So I can have a universe that's expanding and has gravitational waves in it. And I balance this equation so that works. Um, or I can have, um, you know, expansion balanced by some form of matter. And this is gonna be what we're especially interested in in a cosmological setting. Um, or I could balance expansion with curvature. I could, I could balance curvature with radiation or some form of matter. Um, or I could, you know, balance these in equal parts if I like. And so this is this is sort of the um, equation that, um, that that we can extract from the the more complicated Einstein's equations if we write it out. Uh, and so you may have heard, uh, uh, this is also, if you're familiar with it, um, just another form of the Friedman equations, slightly more complete form. Okay, so, so in cosmology, we're particularly interested in, no, in understanding what the con different contents of the universe are. And so if we're balancing um, different contents of the universe with expansion, then uh, we need some way of <clears throat> uh, measuring expansion of the universe. And so in order to measure expansion, we're going to want to measure distances to objects and see how these distances change as a function of time. So as we look out uh, further and further into the universe, um, how far away do objects seem to be whenever our universe is expanding objects will seem to be moving away from us. And so how quickly are objects moving away from us? Um, so if we can measure that, then we can measure the rate of expansion, and then we can try and infer something about the type of matter in the universe. Okay, so uh, quickly, just a couple different ways to measure how far away something is. Um, you know, it would be great if we could somehow freeze time and take an enormous tape measure and actually you know, send it out to a distant galaxy or something and say, oh, this is exactly how many meters or um, you know, to use a more cosmological distance, this is like how many light years away or how many millions of light years away this distant galaxy is. Um, but um, you know, we can't actually do that experiment. And so here on Earth, uh, what can we actually measure? Well, we can measure the angles that different objects subtend in the sky. So I can look at a galaxy and say, oh, this is you know, so many arc minutes, arc seconds, so many fractions of a degree across. Um, and if I know something about the object's physical size, um, like if it's a galaxy or some other object and I have a very good guess of the, what, what its physical size is, then I can use trigonometry to infer how far away it must be. Um, and so this is, a, a, here I've written this quantity DA, um, this is called an angular diameter distance. Um, and in trig trigonometry, under the assumption that the object only is relatively tiny, like some fraction of a degree, um, then I can define my angular diameter distance this way. Okay, so this is one way of um, inferring a distance to an object, uh, uh, just directly using observables and assuming some properties, some size of the object. Um, there are also these uh, uh, other distance measures called luminosity distances. Um, so this is useful if I have some objects and I know how bright it is. 
Um, so if I know, or in particular, if I know the, the luminosity of the object, so I know how many photons it's sending off in different directions. Um, so if I assume these photons are, as they travel, you know, sort of spreading out in some way as they travel towards us. Um, <clears throat> and I, um, and here on Earth, I measure some uh, number of photons, some flux of photons um, arriving uh, in our telescope or however we're making this observation. Um, I can relate uh, this flux uh, to the luminosity using uh, this equation uh, down here. Uh, and this defines this notion of, an, of, of a luminosity distance. And so if I wanted, I could, I could rearrange this equation and then solve for um, DL here. And this is another way of inferring a distance. Um, okay, so one, one final way is to, in an expanding universe, what we can do is measure how redshifted photons become. Um, so as the universe expands, we expect the observed energy of photons to decrease. Uh, there, there are a couple different ways of thinking about this. Um, but it's, it's okay to think of this as in an expanding universe, um, if my space time is expanding, this means it looks like objects far away from me have some uh, recession velocity, they're, they're moving away from me. And so if they send light in my direction, there will be some Doppler shift of photons. Um, so this is uh, an idea we can use to um, probe roughly how, um, uh, like we, we can look at, uh, for example, spectra of objects. Um, so if we look at a star, it's emitting light and some band, some known frequency, uh, sending us photons in some, of some frequency. We can see how, um, um, how much the frequency has changed. Uh, and this in turn, defines this notion of redshift. Uh, so redshift is this quantity Z here and the expressions are written down there. Um, so, so quick question in the chats and I think Mike's answered it, but uh, uh, yes, um, with the exception, yeah, and so Mike is correct. Yes, the density of these components is decreasing. Um, with the exception of, it turns out, dark energy. Uh, and I can say a little bit of, uh, more about this later. Um, so dark energy is this weird substance that, you know, the, the more I expand my universe, uh, oddly, the density of it does not seem to decrease. And so there, there's <clears throat> dark energy, which comprises most of the universe, is this really weird exception. Um, but, but ordinary matter, yes, absolutely. The density of these components does decrease. Um, okay, so if I look at, <clears throat> um, so, so, so what I can do now, if, if I measure distances, angular diameter distances or luminosity distances, um, and I plot these as a function of redshift to objects, um, what I can construct is the, a plot of uh, this, you know, some distance measure uh, versus redshift here. Um, and so here, this plot in particular is for different uh, supernova surveys. So supernova um, are exploding stars and we have some information about um, exactly what the uh, luminosity of supernova will be. And so we can infer luminosity distances or this is a, a slightly different way of writing that in terms of um, um, uh, magnitudes of supernova. So as a function of redshift, um, uh, we, we can compute this um, luminosity distance. And then depending on how the universe has expanded uh, or what the expansion history um, of the universe looks like, um, uh, this, this curve going through all these points can look different. And so here I've, uh, here on the bottom, there are shown a, a few different possible um, expansion histories. Um, along with all the, the supernova we measure. And so this um, gray, this gray dashed one it says, okay, suppose we only have um, roughly 30% of the universe is uh, composed of matter and we have no dark energy. 
Uh, and so we get we get this gray line. Um, and then I, I do still have to balance Einstein's equations. So sort of implicit in this figure, there's uh, some other term, which, which turns out to be curvature just to balance the equation. But um, <clears throat> so, so that gives me this gray dashed line um, um, down here. You can by eye see, okay, you know, all the points uh, here, they lie above this gray line. And so I'm not, that this gray line is clearly not gonna be a good model. Um, we can also consider, okay, what happens if we only have matter? Um, that's this sort of maroon dashed line. Well, that's, that's even worse. So we definitely have something that does not look like, um, I mean, and by matter here, I'm including both ordinary matter and dark matter. So, so the universe is not made of only ordinary and dark matter. Um, then we have this uh, teal line, which corresponds to having but about 70, a bit more than 70% uh, dark energy, and then a bit more than, sorry, a bit less than 75% dark energy, and a bit more than uh, a quarter matter in the form of both um, ordinary and dark matter. And so this line, um, okay, th this one runs through the data points. And so just looking at these different models, we can uh, even by eye pick out, okay, there must, you know, indeed it looks like there must be some dark energy to balance out the amount of matter we have. Okay, and so <clears throat> we can do this not just using supernova. Um, so here I'm showing uh, um, the inferred expansion rates uh, today. So if I were to look at what the rate of expansion today is, uh, this tells me, uh, or this, this defines this, um, uh, what we call the Hubble constant here. And so I can, try and, I can try and infer what the Hubble constant looks like today, not just using supernova, but other observations as well. So supernova are only one type of object we can measure distances to. Um, and so I can, I can say you know, a quick word about all these different ones, but uh, you know, this, is a, this is kind of its own story that could take an hour. So I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail. Um, um, but, but suffice to say, there are other kinds of stars or other objects um, in the universe um, that give us, that we can also infer either angular diameter distances to, because we know how large they are, or we can infer luminosity distances too, because we have a good estimate of how bright these things are. Um, and so that's uh, all these different measurements of what uh, the Hubble constant must be um, sort of in the lower part of this plot. And we have a, a couple more measurements, which I'll discuss in a bit, um, um, that come from much earlier in the universe, but I'm not going to discuss those uh, right away. <clears throat> and so if, I, so if I take all these measurements in, um, in aggregate, if I um, combine all these measurements, then I get uh, um, sort of a, a best guess or best estimate for what the local expansion rate, what the, what the Hubble constant will be. And that's this uh, 73 number. Uh, Jim, we have a question about the uh, isotropy of the expansion. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, the expansion we observe isotropic, uh, as best we can tell, uh, it, the answer seems to be yes. Um, we don't have significant evidence at the moment uh, that I'm aware of for uh, an isotropy. So this, th these initial assumptions that went into our cosmological model, they at least from an observational standpoint, appear to be good ones. Things do indeed look um, not just isotropic, but homogeneous. Um, in fact, I, I can even say anomalously so, we're uh, to some degree surprised by how um, isotropic and homogeneous the universe looks. Okay, um, so, so we do have this model. Um, and observationally, you know, we've noticed um, we need some form of dark energy to explain our observations. Um, but you know, we don't have a fundamental. We, we don't have an, a, a great fundamental model for what um, what dark energy actually is. But we also don't yet have a great fundamental model for what uh, dark matter is. We, you know, have, of course, have a better, hand, better handle on matter we can actually see. Um, so there's omega B parameter. Um, and we've observed also homogeneity and isotropy, but we would like to understand why these assumptions work. I mean, observation, observationally, they appear to be the case, but we'd also like to know um, 
from more from first principles why exactly this is the case. Um, so this is actually a, a good point to pause and see if there are any other questions, at least one other one here. Uh, is there a correction applied to how far away things are since that light came from longer ago? Um, from the observational side, all I really need to worry about is how I've defined my angular diameter distance and redshift. Um, but on the, on the theoretical side, um, I do need to uh, roughly account for that, you know, when, when light was emitted from an object longer ago, it will have traveled to us. You know, it, it was emitted longer ago and it's traveled to us through this expanding universe. And so that's um, affected sort of the angular size of the object in the case of measuring angular diameter distances um, or how bright the object appears in the case of luminosity distances. Um, so the, the correction is, is really there and, the way we've defined uh, angular diameter and luminosity distances and how we um, infer expansion from this. So it's, uh, yes, I'd say it needs to be accounted for and, and it should be in the models. Um, so are the speeds at which cosmic elements are expanding relatively constant or at different rates? Uh, and if different, is there a pattern? Um, Uh, there are a couple answers I think I can give to this, or a, a couple ways I can think of to answer the question. Uh, Kenneth, do you want to maybe say a word about what you mean? Uh, well, since the universe is expanding, I was curious as, you know, if the expansion is homogeneous or if it, you know, if, if it based on where you are, at distance from us, you'll be moving away faster than the stuff that's closer to us. That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, is the, yeah. So I can I can try and give you two different answers here. Um, one is sort of a picture. You know, if we were some um, omniscient observer, what a picture of the universe might look like, and then what we actually, as a single observer in the universe, uh, could see. Um, so it, it, it doesn't look constant from our own standpoint, uh, just because we're looking, uh, as we look out, light has a finite speed. And so the further away we look, also the further back in time we're looking. And so if we're looking further back in time, the rate of expansion of the universe might have been different further back in time. And so to us, um, um, uh, the rate of expansion, the further out we look, it, it can look different. Uh, but if I were able to somehow freeze time and be some omniscient, omnipotent observer, then uh, expansion across some large swath of the universe uh, to, to a very good approximation, though not perfectly, it does look very uniform. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, is our solar system expanding, getting larger in diameter? Um, uh, Approximately no, but if I want to be more careful, then I think I would say uh, to some very, very small extent. Um, so if I look at uh, uh, this h naught parameter, um, so this is a measure of how far things away are moving uh, versus um, how far away they are. Uh, this is actually a rate. So if I take a velocity divided by a difference, I get one over a time. and uh, if I, if I, I can consider what this, um, so sort of what the, the fractional, what, what H naught is in different units. And so uh, in some units, um, H naught is, if I want to ask what H naught is in Hertz, uh, turns out it's about 10 to the minus 18 Hertz. Um, and so this tells me that my lengths will change by roughly a part in 10 to the 18, which is a really tiny number each second. And so over time scales of the universe on really small distances, um, there's no way to notice this. Uh, so, so practically, uh, for, for all practical purposes, um, we don't have to account for cosmological expansion in our own solar system. Or really in, uh, if you like, really, we don't have to account for it in any sort of gravitationally bound structure. Uh, 
it, it, it turns out to be a little, you know, to some degree important if you're, when you start considering things on galactic scales, but. Okay, any other questions? All right, so, so I'm gonna go through this um, and another layer of detail now, so get a little more technical. Um, so every, everything I've said so far has assumed at least to some degree that, um, oh, sorry, another quick question. Are there any limits to expansion? Uh, uh, like is, uh, there are a couple ways I can interpret that question. One is, um, um, like, can the expansion be as slow or as fast as you want? And I think the answer to that is, in, in principle, it could be as slow or as fast as you want. Einstein's equations don't really um, prevent that from happening. Uh, or I could also think of this as like, is there a physical limit? Um, like, does the universe stop expanding once you reach some um, far away distance, like in that limit? Uh, and the answer to that is not as far as we know. Every everything seems to look very, again, homogeneous and isotropic. The expansion looks very similar everywhere. Um, but everywhere at this time, maybe in the past, it'll look different. But. Okay, <clears throat> um, and, and so, so again, things on large scales do look very close to homogeneous and isotropic, but not perfectly. Um, and so I can also ask um, what's, happens when I consider the fact that the universe is not, uh, you know, not perfectly homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, and so now I want to uh, introduce a couple ideas. Um, in particular, I want to inter consider what happens when I have some small departure from homogeneity and isotropy. Um, let's say I had this in the very early universe. Um, so if we think if we consider what happens to the universe, if we go backwards in time, or in turn, if we look further and further out, the universe used to be much more compact, much more dense. Um, so I, mean, I can squeeze it together. Turns out if I start squeezing it, then I'm gonna heat it up. And so in the past, the universe used to be much hotter. And so I can think about, you know, what happened if um, uh, to the universe if uh, there were small departures from homogeneity and isotropy in this early, um, hot universe. All right, so now I'm going to get to the uh, <clears throat> uh, this idea of this phenomenon called baryon acoustic oscillations. Um, and so here, let's say I have some uh, some amount of matter. I have this. Uh, let me wait for this animation to reset. Uh, hopefully, this is um, making it over Zoom. Okay, but. You know, sometimes animations don't come across too well. Um, okay, so, so I start off with some, um, some over density, some, you know, collection of mass. Uh, let's say I put some dark matter, some baryons, and some, some photons, or if I like radiation, uh, I, just, I just put a blob of this somewhere in space, and everywhere else it's mostly uniform. Um, so what, what happens? Uh, so the, um, if things are hot enough, uh, my ordinary matter, I'll have atoms, atoms will have been, and then I'll have photons. Um, if the photons are hot en or energetic enough, so my matter is uh, hot enough, then my photons will be able to ionize my atoms. And so I'll have uh, uh, a plasma in the early universe. I'll have electrons and photons uh, and um, protons all scattering off of each other. And there will be some pressure associated with this. And so my photons and <clears throat> um, baryons will want to sort of push each other out. And so we see, uh, indeed, if I, if I look at what's happening in this plot, my photons and baryons, they do you know, kind of fly off. Um, and <clears throat> at some points, uh, there's this interesting uh, bump that appears. And so this bump appears at a point where the, um, you know, as, as this is going on, if I have this over density, as my photons and baryons are sort of bouncing off each other and expanding out, uh, the universe itself 
kind of underneath all of this is also expanding and the temperature is dropping. And at some point uh, the universe cools enough um, that the photons are no longer energetic enough to keep the atoms, uh, uh, the gas in the universe ionized. And so at that point, um, the photons no longer interact. Um, there, aren't, there aren't charges in the universe for the photons to scatter off of. Um, so the photons at that point just you know, fly off and it, eventually we do get to observe those photons. Um, so that, that'll be important. But then uh, we also have um, uh, uh, the plasma itself uh, becomes neutral and starts to look like you know, more, more like a uh, something that's dark matter. It's just matter that's sitting there. It's not, uh, it's to a large extent no longer bouncing off of itself or interacting significantly. Um, and so, so when, when this transition occurs, uh, we get this and sort of another over density, we get this um, additional bump in the distribution of matter. Okay, uh, and then eventually the cold dark matter itself notices, oh, there's this, you know, there happen to be more baryons um, um, in, this, in this particular area. And so the dark matter um, also tries, you know, will fall into the gravitational well created by the ordinary matter. And then we're, we're left with this bump. Um, and so the, the uh, y-axis in these diagrams are sort of the you know, different measures of the amount of matter here. And the x-axis is the size, if you like, of, um, of this dense region. And so I'm starting off with a very compact, uh, um, very compact distribution of matter, and it's expanding outwards. And so there's a uh, uh, this is just a measure of how large it is. And so in particular, these units here, uh, uh, this is in units of MPC megaparsecs, uh, which roughly you can think of as millions of light years. Uh, so so these are these are enormous, um, like cosmological in scale, if you like. Um, of course, in the early universe, we don't just have one of these little blobs. We have um, um, really some, our, our best theories of how, what would happen in the early universe suggest that we had some statistical ensemble of them and not just of dense regions, but also regions that were less dense than uh, average. And so our early universe looks like, uh, here we have this animation, we're just stacking a bunch of these up. Um, This play. We're stacking a bunch of these up, and then eventually, once we stacked you know, sort of a statistically significant amount of these, we wind up with uh, sort of a random distribution of um, um, fluctuations. Okay, and then we can. <clears throat> so, so we also so, so in this past uh, in this last picture, we also saw that okay, these photons uh, they you know they kind of flew off. Uh, it turns out eventually we do get to observe those, uh, so we get to observe. Um, a pattern in the universe that looks uh, just like, and we, like we, we get to observe at least what the photons were doing um, or, or how the photons were behaving um, as, as they stopped interacting with matter in the early universe. And so this gives rise to um, what you may have heard of as the cosmic microwave background. And so this is an actual snapshot, <clears throat> um, if you like, of uh, the, 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 there are a few pieces of physics that go into um, um, this, but in, in large part, it's just um, roughly like a, a picture of how more or less dense the universe was in different regions. Um, and so if you, if you look, uh, if you study this picture, you might notice, okay, there's, there seem to be a lot of dimples in it. You know, maybe there are like large regions where Things look a little cold or a little warm, like you know, everything in this region seems to be uh, particularly warm. Everything in this region seems to be kind of cold. But on top of this, there are all these really tiny dimples. These dimples are about a degree across. Um, and this corresponds exactly to that uh, bump we saw. <clears throat> um, so, so why is it microwave now? Uh, so yeah, th these photons you know, used to be energetic enough to ionize um, um, to ionize hydrogen and helium, which were the gases around at the time. Uh, and so that would have been a you know, few thousand degrees Kelvin or so. Um, 
And since that time, the universe has expanded. And um, so, so these, these photons that you know, started off highly energetic um, have uh, redshifted due to cosmological expansion. And so their wavelengths have stretched, if you like. Uh, they, they've gone from these really short wavelength, high energy photons to long wavelength uh, microwaves, if you like. Okay, um, so um, if, if we like, we can consider, um, we, we can try and come up with different ways of statistically classifying the amplitude or statistically classifying um, what these little dimples look like. Um, so if I, so, so I can come up with this measure called a, a power spectrum um, and this power spectrum roughly describes how large my dimples are on a particular, you know, of a particular size. Uh, so, so on this x-axis down here um, of this plot, I have this quantity L, and this is roughly, uh, you, you can think of this as like, if I, you know, take my sky, which is a, a sphere, a hemisphere, and I divide that into some number of segments, this is kind of like the number of segments I've divided it into. So the more segments I divided into, the smaller scale I'm looking at. Um, and then this is roughly the amplitude um, of the dimples uh, of that size. Uh, so here, you know, if I consider only dimples in a particular region, then I get a, um, a sky that looks like, uh, like this animation is showing here. And if I add them all together, I get something that looks more like the CMB, which is the um, leftmost plot here. Um, so you can see, oh, uh, this, there's this peak here. This corresponds to you know, somewhere around a degree. Uh, <clears throat> so all those dimples we saw in the CMB picture, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of them. The amplitude of those dimples tends to be um, largest. And you know, maybe we have some dimples on other scales, but um, 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 the, the, ones, the ones on that degree scale are dominant. Okay, so as a, um, so, so, so two more things in this section, and then I wanna move on to simulations. Um, so how can we actually use this to infer different ideas in cosmology? Um, so it turns out if we have different amounts of different types of matter, different amounts of types of matter in the universe, then uh, we'll have um, what exactly these, the size of these dimples um, will look different. So if we add uh, different amounts of matter, different amounts of dark energy, uh, we could also imagine adding curvature, which was one of the other contributions to that conservation of energy equation, uh, different amounts of uh, baryons, so just different amounts of visible matter. Um, then what exactly the, uh, this power spectrum looks like uh, will change. Um, and so, we can effectively do a, um, a, a best fit to, um, um, to, to this power spectrum and extract information about what uh, different types of matter uh, there are in the universe. And so now that this is using more information than just, uh, you know, assuming our universe looks homogeneous and isotropic, uh, here we're using the fact that there are these anisotropic um, um, dimples in our universe. And, and, and something like the CMB um, in order to infer something about different types of matter. Okay, um, so I want to move on to uh, the last part of this. Um, so I'm running a little behind, but so just, just how inhomogeneous is the universe? Um, so this, everything I've told you in this picture has assumed um, our universe has only tiny perturbations or like tiny fluctuations. Um, so if I, if I look back at the CMB plot, uh, the color scale, scale here makes it looks like there are large, um, you know, there, there are really hot and really cold um, or like really dense and really under dense regions in the universe. Um, but I, I've actually subtracted off an average here. Um, so these tiny little dimples are actually only, you know, part in 10 to the five or so. Um, so so, so very, very, like a very, you know, tiny over density, very tiny under density. Um, but if we think about um, what else is in the universe, like if we're interested in 
using galaxies um, or say compact objects to learn more about the content of our universe, then uh, we, we can't just rely on this assumption. And so it turns out when we um, want to think about how, uh, how to model our universe on these scales, um, uh, we need to, um, we need to drop a number of the assumptions that we've been making. Uh, and it turns out the best, most accurate way to do this, if you like, is uh, using numerical simulations. Okay, so just as uh, a couple examples of where we need numerical simulations in order to understand what's going on. Um, um, so, uh, so, so if I'm interested, let's say on the, um, let me start with this right plot. If I'm interested in, for example, modeling processes, like I have two black holes uh, and they wanna hit each other and I wanna understand this process in detail. Um, uh, I, need, I need simulations in order to do this. So I can, I can work out with pen and paper uh, sort of what, um, what things look like when I have two black holes that are just orbiting each other. Um, and I can also work out with pen and paper what things look like um, after two black holes have merged. Um, but if I want to work out what you know, things look like during the actual merger process itself, I need um, uh, simulations, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and so black holes are one tool. They're another observable, like, uh, like supernova or like the CMP that we can use to infer information about cosmology. Um, so if you like, you can use black holes to infer um, the Hubble constant. Um, so another, another place, um, uh, we need simulations. Uh, so if we look at uh, uh, other power spectra, and so here I'm not plotting, um, so, so here I'm plotting not what the cosmic microwave background power spectrum looks like, but what the power spectrum of uh, the distribution of galaxies looks like. Um, and I, can, I can stick around, I guess, and say more about uh, what, what I mean by this um, afterwards, if you like. But, uh, but the idea <clears throat> here is if I, if I consider what the universe looks like, um, consider what my overdensities, underdensities look like on very large scales, um, I can more or less with pen and paper come up with some model, assume things um, look very close to homogeneous and isotropic. Um, and I, I don't really need simulations of complicated objects like galaxies or clusters of galaxies in order to understand uh, what's going on if I'm considering large patches of the universe. Uh, but as I consider smaller and smaller patches in the universe, things look more and more complicated. And so if I'm considering objects like galaxies or clusters of galaxies or even smaller, uh, then increasingly I'm gonna need to model very complicated processes. Um, Um, and it turns out my, um, what I'm calling linear, linear here is uh, an analytic, it's an approximate model. Um, what I'm calling nonlinear here is um, basically what, what simulations will predict. And so what the power looks like, <clears throat> um, given these two different, um, given some approximate and some more exact model, these two things look quite different. And so on small scales here, I, re I really do need simulations. Um, so that said, and this is the last slide before I turn it over, um, modern simulations often do agree with each other. And so here, um, uh, these are a, a couple ideas uh, and I'm actually, actually want to, so this is gonna be the most striking example of how simulations might differ. So here, if I run, hopefully this is um, making it over Zoom okay. Um, but if I look at two simulations, uh, I set them up with exactly the same initial conditions, exactly the same um, different types of matter, and I look at how structures form in these, um, you'll notice they're actually, in some cases, uh, especially when we're looking at something like temperature of gases, quite large differences uh, between what different simulations tell me. Um, so if I, had, if I had a perfect model of formation of structure in the universe, what I'm showing on the right and the left here should agree perfectly. Um, but you know, clearly as we're seeing here, 
uh, uh, they don't. And uh, this, oops, uh, I made this up here. Um, yeah, so, so, so it turns out that uh, simulations, modern simulations disagree uh, with themselves to some extent. And so there's much more work to be done. Um, as one last point, uh, we also need, in order to look at what the, in order to understand what the universe would look like, if we make small tweaks to, you know, the amount of matter in the universe, the amount of curvature, the amount of dark energy, dark matter, uh, if, we, if we make small adjustments to all these different um, amounts of matter in the universe, then we'll need to, uh, uh, turns out we need to run simulations of what the universe looked like um, uh, for many different combinations of these parameters. And so not only do we need to improve the accuracy of our simulations, we need to run quite a large uh, number of them. Um, and so uh, now I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, Corinne Summers, who is a student who's been working on um, state-of-the-art gravitational simulations, in particular has been looking at um, uh, colliding black holes. And I'll let her uh, say more about this. Do I have a screen sharing privileges? I just enabled them, I think. Okay, thank you. Let me share my window. Cool. So yeah, as uh, Dr. Mortens was saying, my name is Corinne Summers. I'm a junior uh, and I've been working with him since uh, the spring, working on uh, numerical relativity, general rel relativity. Uh, this summer, I worked on making this simulation that you're seeing on the screen. It is a simulation of colliding black holes done using numerical methods. So numerical relativity is essentially just solving general relativity problems, you know, Einstein's equations, but with algorithms. Um, and often that ends up being, you know, computer code, things like that. Um, and often they actually require supercomputers. So it's not beyond what one single person could do, beyond what a single computer could do. Often you need a supercomputer to even run these simulations. So they're very, not accessible to most people. Um, but uh, Professor Mertens was able to find this group called Black Holes at Home that had made NERBY Plus, which is a uh, Python code based uh, C generation software. And C is just a very, um, very optimized, very quick type of code. Um, or like code language, and it was able to run numerical relativity simulations, specific ones, um, on a desktop. So it could be run on, you know, any any laptop. Um, however, those were also kind of geared towards grad students, people who really kind of know what they're doing. Even the first time I looked at it, I was I had no idea what was going on. So I wanted to make something that was really accessible, something I could just send to a friend if they were ever interested in general relativity and say, hey, this is kind of what I'm learning in class, um, maybe check it out. And so uh, using Inscription, which is a C code to WebAssembly, which just means that um, you can then run it in a browser, um, I was able to make a browser-based simulator for colliding black holes. So that way you can just send this link once it's made public and run a numerical relativity simulation. And it uses your own your own computing power, so you don't need any sort of special equipment or anything. So this is what the simulation looks like. Uh, right now, you're just seeing the axes. Um, it runs by taking a special formulation of Einstein's equations called the BSSM three plus one, um, which is just really good for colliding black holes um, and just generally areas of high gravity for making simulations like those. Um, and it uses those equations and takes something called the method of lines RK4 time-stepping algorithm to, uh, which is kind of just the, the code, the numerical relativity portion of it, and uses it to evolve your space forward in time. So I'm gonna run, here I'll run the laps and just stop it. So what you're seeing on screen, and I'll zoom out a bit, is a spatial slice. So the red and blue axes are you know uh, x y coordinates and then the purple line is your function. So in order to you know visualize a colliding black hole, we need to make 
we can't really visualize it in four dimensions for each of these different functions. So we just take two and then graph your function here. All of these functions, there are 24 of them actually, come from different things in Einstein's equations. So the one you're seeing right now is the lapse function, which essentially defines how fast time moves in a specific space. So you can see where the two black holes are right now. The, you know, the function's a lot lower there. And so if you've ever seen something like interstellar, where they go to the planet like near a black hole and time runs slower there, that's kind of what the lapse function um, graphs. So um, taking, we, I, which, so over the summer, I took the code, uh, the Nervy Plus code, uh, edited a bit to make sure I can access it using uh, JavaScript later. And then this sim the visualization is done using uh, 3.js, which is a JavaScript just, uh, visualization package. So once you're on the simulation, you can click Run Simulation. We'll just do that. And it takes a little time. And you can see at, each, at regular time intervals, it will compute um, you know, the evolution and then, all, and then spit out that visualization data and then visualize it here. And one thing you will notice uh, is that the entire grid seems to fall a little bit at the end. You can see that's happening right now. That is actually not physically accurate. That is due to boundary conditions that we have to apply to our simulation in order for it to work properly because towards uh, when you get to really big distances that things happen. So you have to add in certain boundary conditions and the ones we used allow the code to run faster, but it also ends up with this kind of uh, sinking thing that happens at the end. So once the simulation has run, you can click animate and watch the whole thing happen again, which I've just done a lot because it's just fun. You can look at from different angles um, and go through all the different functions you have in here. Now, in order to make this, the whole point was to make it really accessible. So we also added a info session, in information section area, um, talking about you know, the motivation of the project, uh, how it actually works. So you know, a little bit about these you know, spatial slices um, and like what exactly, you know, what data we start with and how we change it up. And then a little bit of information about some of the different functions. So this is the shift function, which kind of describes how space moves um, from one from one like from one piece uh, spatial slice to another, so forward in time. Um, if you get towards gravity, kind of the space bends a bit, and so your coordinates will move a bit, and that's kind of that's what the shift function talks about. So the lapse function is how time kind of changes. Shift function is how space changes, um, and some other ones as well. And then a little bit of background on BSSN, um, curvilinear, which is just uh, specific coordinates, um, and then more contact information. Uh, in the future, I'm actually currently working on a the pretty similar simulation, except for it also includes uh, the Psi4 function, which is a part of the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, I am blanking on the word, it's the spatial metric, spatial metric that uh, Professor Mertens was talking about earlier, and it describes gravitational waves. So if you've heard of that, like LIGO, et cetera, I'm hoping to visualize that as well. I think that's that's it for me. Um, I will stick around afterwards if anyone has any questions or if there are any. I don't think I can see the chat right now, but. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Corinne. Um, yeah, one of the, well, I don't know if you saw, one of the questions was, will neutron star collisions be next? Um, it could be in the future. The after Psi four, what the current plan is to work with a collapse, a scalar field collapse, because uh, one it's it's an area of just simulations that there's not much work done in currently. Uh, but because BSSN is really good for just general areas of high gravity, it's certainly possible. Yeah. Then one other question uh, you mentioned using one's, your own computer. Is it CPU intensive or GPU intensive? That I am not positive about. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if I could answer that. Uh, Professor Mertens, if, if you- Yeah, could. it's um, a little, 
So, so the, the senior I asked a question. Um, hey, do you hear me? Yeah. I asked a question. I, I just bought a, a massive uh, machine with a uh, 3080 uh, RTX. So I, I wonder if that would do any better. <laughs> so the, the plot itself is uses um, the GPU and the simulation itself runs on the CPU. Um, okay. so the combination. Okay. okay, thank you. And the simulation actually does work on mobile even. So yeah, you could run it on your phone if you wanted. Yeah. I'm going to try it, surely. Thank you. And uh, uh, Jim Small did put a link in the chat to uh, the website here. So thank you. Yeah, please check it out. Uh, yeah, thank you, Karen. Right. So next, let me uh, share. Yeah, so, so next I was going to, um, next I've asked Will Charles to um, say a couple words about machine learning technique, uh, machine learning techniques and cosmology, which have been uh, increasingly the rage in a number of fields. Um, so Will is a, a graduate student I've been working with also um, uh, starting this past summer. Yeah, hi there. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm Will, like Dr. Merton said. I, I won't take up too much of your time here, but uh, I'll just say, say a few words about sort of the machine learning and cosmology, the, this current state of the art. Well, machine learning, if you're not aware, is uh, the development of algorithms that can improve themselves over time um, with little or no input from you after you write them. So there's many, many famous examples of, of this type of program, but like neural networks are, are maybe more commonly known. Um, but there's many different types of programs that, that do this, this same thing. Well, how does it actually work? Uh, I mean, basically, you train programs to learn the same way that people learn. You go through a new experience, you get new information about something, and then later you are able to change your behavior in, in response and develop your behavior over time. Um, so in sort of the exact same vein, uh, the machine learning programs will collect an input and produce an output. Um, and then you, the, the computer scientist looking at the data, you'll say, well, this one was right or this one was wrong and how wrong was it? Uh, and then the computer will go back and correct uh, the way that it produces the output. And you do this over and over again. And for very large data sets, um, which we, we have now, you know, more and more data is, is being generated at an increasing rate. Um, it, it's able to, we're able to train these programs to be really very accurate. Um, you know, even when seeing data that it's never seen before, um, which is, you know, obviously the, the main use of, of this type of algorithm. So there's many applications in cosmology, uh, like, so computer vision is, is a, a big area of, of research for machine learning. Um, there's lots of like identifying galaxies, um, things that, that sort of typically have to be done by humans and, and take a long time, uh, you know, could, could be done much faster, more efficiently by uh, computers, by computer vision software. Um, although you, you have to be careful. I mean, of course, computer vision is, is still somewhat in its infancy. Uh, even though it's a lot faster than, than like a human looking at pictures, it, it's, uh, has a lot more, um, a very, very narrow focus. Um, and, and they, they can be wrong. So stuff you worry about, but, uh, scientists now have started to use machine learning to study the output of simulations. So like you run a certain simulation over and over again, um, and produce lots of different outputs. And then you, what you can actually do is train a machine learning algorithm to identify the output of the simulation um, just given the input. Um, and it's, it's a lot faster. I mean, training will take a long time, but then after that, it would be a lot faster to just take a new input and then have your machine learning program give you the output and you don't even have to run the simulation, All right? So this is uh, an active area of research, right? Because you're, you're, you're thinking about eliminating lots of computational time that you spend on, on you know, large simulations. Um, yeah, so another approach uh, is kind of what I, what I touched on before, like using uh, certain types of 
uh, computer vision <clears throat> and large, large neural networks to uh, identify different properties of galaxies uh, from something like the dark matter distribution or even from the like visible matter distribution. Um, but this uh, approach is, is pretty generalizable um, to like other, uh, other, other features of galaxies that you're looking for, right? Um, so a specific project that I'm working on right now is uh, on the topic of chameleon gravity, which is a, a scalar tensor theory of gravity that basically suggests that um, there's an additional uh, scalar field. There's an additional field in, 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 in gravity that uh, is highly coupled to how much matter is around you. So if there's a lot of matter around, that field has a very small value uh, or very small, uh, it's not measurable, okay? And in areas where there is uh, no matter or it's much less dense, like in the space between galaxies, interstellar space, um, that field uh, would have, uh, would be measurable, have a much different value. Um, so in this theory, it's, it's possible that uh, you could measure a different effective Newton's constant um, out in deep space than you do on earth because there's so much mass here. Uh, it, it's, it's difficult to, to do experiments um, probing this uh, theory of gravity because on earth there's like lots of mass around you and it, you can try and make like a vacuum chamber, but those um, are not that big. So it's hard to get to areas of, of low density, right? So how do we test this sort of thing? Well, we need to do lots of calculations, um, lots of simulations to see what gravity would look like if the chameleon field existed, um, because then you're gonna wanna compare that to experiment. So this type of basically the chameleon field obeys, um, you know, so, some complicated differential equations. So it takes computers a long time to calculate numerically the results of these equations. Um, so what I'm working on now is doing basically what, what I outlined before, like using uh, machine learning to look at the inputs and outputs from the equation uh, that, that governs the behavior of the chameleon field and learn how to produce the output without actually having to solve the equation. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's some of these images you see in the bottom. Actually, I, I just recently um, produced these. It, it looks pretty good. Um, I used a certain type of, of machine learning approach called a generative network um, to, uh, to produce this output. It looks pretty close to, the, to the, the real thing. So, you know, getting somewhere. Oh yeah, and that, that, that was all from me. Thank you, Will. Um, yeah, so, uh, just to quickly wrap up, um, sorry we've run over a little bit, but we you know, have quite a lot of evidence um, pointing towards the existence of new forms of matter. Uh, we don't know what dark energy is. We don't know what dark matter is. Um, um, and moving forward, we're going to need increasingly sophisticated and uh, uh, performant modeling in order to try and answer these questions. Um, Okay, so I think um, we can wrap up there and see if there are any final questions, either for myself, Will, or Karen. I, I have a question. Um, I don't know if you hear me. <laughs> yep. Yes. Um, about this last uh, talk, um, I imagine that if the uh, differential equations of the theory are complicated and the, you have a whole range of boundary conditions, you have to have a good certainty of how many types of, of input output uh, groups you have had and how do you know that you have them all? Um, is that a risk or? Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, you're talking about um, like, so you, you have to make sure that um, in general, the kind of data that you train the program on is gonna be the, at least in the ballpark of the kind of data that it'll see when you're when you're trying to test it, um, yeah, that's that's uh, and and 
an active area of development in, in machine learning is trying to make networks more generalizable to, to different inputs. Yes, an, an exciting uh, proposition. Okay, uh, let me grab one from the chat real quick. Uh, is chameleon gravity a mon theory? Uh, well, do you want to answer this? Do you want me to? Uh, you, you can go okay. ahead. Okay, yeah, I think so. So, so mons, uh, I mean, it's a non-Newtonian theory. So in that sense, it is modified Newtonian dynamics, but mons in particular refers to a um, specific theory where uh, it, like your Poisson equation is, like your, your equations of gravity are modified in a particular way. Um, and the way chameleon gravity modifies them is a little bit different than what Mond proper, if you like, um, the, the way that modifies them. So it, it's not Newtonian gravity. It's not Einsteinian gravity. N neither of these are, but uh, you know, two, two different sort of distinct models of models that are beyond general relativity. Other questions? Um, well, I, I'd really like to thank uh, Professor Mertens and uh, Corinne and, and uh, Will uh, for um, uh, speaking to us today on our behalf. It's always a little difficult to get, you know, the appropriate level of audience appreciation conveyed across Zoom. Um, so I'll just act as a proxy for the entire audience in thanking you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and everyone for attending. And I think uh, next week, um, you know, we'll have uh, the first of three lectures uh, by members of the Earth and Planetary Science Department, also members of the McDonald Center for Space Sciences. And they're going to be talking about, uh, um, you know, planetary physics um, and, uh, you know, the exciting things that are going on in that area of the space sciences. So we'll see you there.